Well, as I prayed this morning, today, this morning, is the first Sunday in Lent. Uh, now, I just need to clarify for you. Uh, you know about Lent, and we know a lot of things about Lent, but some of them we don't. Uh, Lent is the 40-day period, weekdays period, between Ash Wednesday and Easter. And I made an important uh, clarification there to say the 40 weekdays. Because if you do your quick math and count from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday, you will come up with more than 40 days. However, if you remove the Sundays, which are always feast days during Lent, you will find 40 days. So we have 40 days in Lent, or 40 days of Lent, of which the Sundays are in but not of. And why do I say that? Uh, is anybody uh, engaging in a Lenten fast? I am. I pray every year. Lord, what, what is it? And, and sometimes it's pretty challenging. One year, and everybody said, oh, pastor, you're going to be awful to live with. I gave up coffee for Lent. <laughs> that same year, I also did meatless Fridays. And you know which was the more difficult for me? Meatless Fridays. Uh, coffee was not that big of a deal. I mean, I mean, I was ready on Sunday on the feast day to have my cup of coffee, but, you know, I didn't have, because I'm not addicted to coffee, as my brother showed me last night, uh, I just have a very committed relationship with my coffee. <laughs> Sundays are always feast days during Lent. Uh, they're that, it, it is that time, and by the way, if you've never taken a Lenten fast, I would encourage you to. Not simply to say I'm fasting something for Lent, but fasting is a very important practice for us. It is a spiritual discipline whereby we experience the grace of Jesus Christ. Richard Foster, that great spiritual uh, writer of earlier in my own generation, said, There is nothing on the face of the earth that exposes your inner motives more than does fasting. By the way, have you ever heard this term, hangry? <coughs> My daughter, Abby, will say that very frequently. I'm hangry. If you want to find out the things that spiritually have a hold on you, practice a fast. And by the way, you say, oh, pastor, I have you know, medical issues, I can't fast. Oh, you can fast. You can fast from all kinds of things. Uh, I am fasting sweets for Lent. That's one of the things you know, that the Lord has just kind of convicted me of. I'm, I'm looking at those things which seem to have a hold on me. I confessed to somebody this week, there is one substance in the world that I have absolutely no willpower over when it comes to, and it's not chocolate. Oh, no, it's not chocolate. It's, not, it's peanut butter. It's peanut butter. I can eat peanut butter by the spoonful. Uh, but you know, for Lent, I'm giving that all up. I will have dessert for lunch today because it's a feast day. But you see, what fasting does is it exposes those things that have a hold on you. And it's not something to do, and by the way, the only reason I share with you is to give you some ideas. Uh, maybe you could fast social media or television. Or, and by the way, talk to Linda you all know Linda Shrove, I hope by now, by name. She's in the back with Alice. She sent me the coolest uh, social media meme this week. Things to fast from to receive more of God. And that's what a fast is designed to do. It is designed to give something up, to break those, the power of those things that have a hold on us so we can experience more of God's grace. More on that in a moment. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. Past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the 40-day journey that Christians all over the world take from Ash Wednesday to the cross and to the tomb. By the way, if you're astute, you walked in and you witnessed Eleanor and Mary's ministries this week as we have switched from the white of Transfiguration Sunday last week to the purple of Lent and for the next 40 days. Purple is the color of royalty, is the color of passion. Uh, we will be decked in purple. 
Our pyramids have turned from the green of ordinary time and the white of transfiguration to the purple of Lent. It reminds us that we consider time and space to be sacred. Time is not just something we have that we mark down. That's a very pagan way to consider time. We pass off the days, the weeks, the months, the years. No, when we are followers of Jesus Christ, we consider time and space to belong to God. Time is the commodity that we steward to create the holy space that God uses to draw us closer to God through Jesus Christ and to more fully form us in the image of his Son. As I've already said, some have or will practice a Lenten fast. By the way, if you haven't yet chosen a fast, pray about it. Practice a Lenten fast this Lenten season. They, they give something up, a practice, a something they enjoy that interrupts our normal routines so that we create a thin space between heaven and earth where God has the ability to more powerfully speak into our souls, where the Holy Spirit might address our internal motivations and give God the freedom to speak into our souls. There's nothing magical about a fast other than intentionally denying ourselves. By the way, I remember hearing some words from Jesus when disciples came to him and said, Sir, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said something like this. Deny yourself. Ooh, that's not a popular word in our society today, is it? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. There's nothing magical about a fast other than intentionally denying ourselves to create that thin place between heaven and earth where the Holy Spirit can work in us. To give attention and intention to our spirituality, something we do not do nearly enough. Oh, there are so many things that buy for our time and our attention that we go with the flow. You know what goes with the flow, right? Can I be a little sarcastic? Trash down the river. And so many times, our souls and our, our lives reflect that inattention to the details of our walk with God through Jesus Christ. The purpose of Lent is to spend time in examination, in repentance, remembering and acknowledging our utter dependence on God for life, for salvation, and for righteousness. Those of you that were either here Wednesday night or in another Lent service heard the celebrants place the ashes on your forehead and say these words, Remember, from dust you have come, and to dust you will return. That is a powerful affirmation of our dependence on God, because it is from that dust that God created. It is into that dust that God breathed life. None of this depends on us. Lent is that time to reflect and be reminded that we are absolutely dependent on God through Jesus Christ for life. So, during these 40 days, we give attention to who Jesus is, to what Jesus does, and to where that Lenten journey ultimately takes us, to a cross and to a tomb. Matthew begins our Lenten journey this year. The passage from Matthew chapter 4 that Joan read for you this morning in your presence is being read in churches all over the world this morning. It is the gospel lection for Lent. By the way, if you're wanting to know where I'll be preaching for the next six weeks, I will be tracking the gospels through the lectionary through Lent. We'll be hearing each week what the gospel writer teaches us about who Jesus is, about what the ministry of Jesus Christ is, and what that means for us today. 
This passage from Matthew chapter 4 introduces us to Matthew, Son of God. And the fact is, for many, this reading is problematic. Because we do not find here a Savior who is robed in honor and glory. And we do not find a Savior who takes the easy way out. We find a Savior who comes literally known as the Son of God, who challenges everything we want about and in life. Remember what's going on. In Matthew chapter 3, uh, Matthew introduces us to Jesus Christ. He comes to the Jordan River. He comes to be baptized by John. John is horrified. Like, you should, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. Jesus says, no, I've come to fulfill the Father's witness. He has come to identify with humankind. He is baptized as we must be. And as he comes from the water, literally the heavens open up and the voice of God is heard as the dove of the Holy Spirit descends, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What a powerful and profound word. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine right now, were Jesus to be standing in the midst of us, the, the roof literally to be peeled back, a dove to descend, and hear those words as thunder claps in the east, My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This will come back to haunt us through this passage. People who love to see the grand and the spectacular. I would submit to you on the banks of the Jordan River that day, Jesus could have recruited an army then and there, and they could have advanced on Jerusalem because the people saw the spectacular. But throughout the Gospels, Jesus refuses the human agenda to embrace signs and wonders and be spectacular. Because literally moments after those words are said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Jesus enters the desert called by God for his 40 day journey to fast 40 days and 40 nights. To those who would preach comfort and prosperity and wealth and happiness this story of Jesus flies in the face of that. The one who is embraced by the power of God so tangibly goes off to a solitary place to fast for 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness. The wilderness is always in Scripture a metaphor for times of trial. Always. Always a metaphor for times of discomfort. Have you seen images of the wilderness over around Palestine? It is a harshly unpleasant place to live. It is viciously hot during the day. I don't mean hot like here hot. I mean like 120 plus degrees hot. With a baking, frying sun. And all kinds of creepy crawlers that just love to bite and torment. And no water. And certainly no Starbucks or quarter candy store or... Oh yeah, but then something crazy happens at night. That insane brain-baking sun turns off and is replaced by bone-chilling snot freezing cold every night. So your body, which finally acclimates to the heat, is now thrust back into this place where it needs to generate heat. And by the way, there are no calories to generate heat because you're in the wilderness. So nothing works quite right in the wilderness. It is not lost on me. It should not be lost on you as we begin our Lenten journey that Jesus goes from the affirmation of the approval of God into a time of wilderness. For 40 days and 40 nights, he's there enduring the trial. The Son of God. By the way, 
Let's reflect for a moment on this incarnation thing that we believe. Jesus is very God of very God, who traded the glory of heaven for the mean life that we experience, and the life lived in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. All I need for some of you is to ask you this question, and it doesn't even begin to experience the trade-off. Now let me ask some of you to say these words. Let's go primitive tent camping. I know how some of you are. Primitive tent camping is when you can't book in a room at the Hampton and you have to book in a, in a room at the roadway. That's primitive. Oh no, we like our comfort. We like our, our shower to be the perfect temperature in the morning. We want you know, these 10 million thread count cotton sheets. And we want our, our thermostat. And by the way, you can speak to your thermostat now and say, Alexa, set my temperature for 68.75 degrees. And your home will be the perfect temperature. Human beings haven't changed in that, ever. We like our comfort. Yet here, as we begin our Lent journey, we meet our Savior in the wilderness. In the wilderness. In the wilderness. And, and there's a part of me that just wants to end the sermon right there. I'm not going to. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> that just wants to remind you. Jesus Christ always meets us in the wilderness because he's already there. He didn't promise a life of comfort. In fact, he practiced life in the wilderness to identify with every emotion we experience. A God who comes into the human experience as one of us suffers and suffers is a challenge to those who would believe God has come to make us fat and happy, as some preach. But that Savior is exactly what we find in Matthew's Gospel. A Savior suffering in the wilderness, whose identity is defined by the wilderness. And can I just go on record as saying Jesus' experience in the wilderness does not one iota diminish God's pronouncement of him days before. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That is not changed because Jesus goes into the wilderness. He is still the beloved son of God with whom God was well pleased even in the wilderness denying himself food for 40 days. Jesus is still the beloved Son of God. By inference, when we are going through the wilderness, that does not diminish who we are in God's eyes. If you want to be rebuked, rebuked, not rebuked, <laughs> rebuked by your pastor, let me catch you saying to somebody who's walking through the wilderness, if you only had enough faith, God wouldn't be doing this to you. Right upside the head. Because that's not where we find our Savior. That's not who God is. Even when we walk in the wilderness, God still loves us. God still treasures us. God is still pleased with us. Immediately after hearing the good news that Jesus is God's son and God is well pleased with Jesus' life and ministry, Jesus heads into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting. By the way, that's a sacred kind of a time in Scripture. It reminds us immediately of Moses. Up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, bringing to us the covenant story of God's love. Israel's 40-year wander in the wilderness, Elijah's 40-day journey where he heard the voice of God in that still, sweet, small way. After 40 days of fasting, Jesus 
is tempted. Can you imagine how that must have gone down? By the way, there's a spiritual premise at work there. The evil one, I'll use Matthew's language, the devil will never attack you when you're strong. He will never attack you when you are at your strongest. Do you think Jesus was depleted? If you're wondering, let me ask you this question. How physically sharp would you be after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? Has anyone fasted for longer than 24 hours? Anyone fasted for longer than seven days? Anyone fasted for longer than 14 days? I have a couple times done seven-day fast. I've known some friends who've done 40s. Let me tell you, at the end of 40 days, your resources are depleted. And let's not forget, the Son of God was fully human. Okay? Do not lose sight of that. We mystify Jesus sometimes. He was human. The devil comes to him after 40 days without food, 40 days going in the wilderness, 40 days alone. This isn't in my notes. It just came to me. And I want to challenge you a little bit this Lenten season. 40 days alone has a very profound and powerful impact on a person. I've been reading and reflecting a lot about silence and solitude. Uh, it has, oh, and by the way, silence in a world that cannot shut up, that we do not turn off. Silence has a way of reorienting a person. I just completed a book by a guy named Kage, who is an explorer. And the guy is famous because he has walked to the three poles of the Earth, North Pole, South Pole, and Mount Everest. And most recently, he is back from a 51-day journey by himself to the South Pole. And I heard him on a podcast, and his book talks about the profound power both to the external world and the internal world. After 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days by himself, 40 days in silence, in the company of the Father, Jesus has this awareness of who he is. And it is then when the tempter comes, the devil. By the way, that's a powerful word, devil. We put all kinds of images with it. You know, you think of the little guy in the Underwood potted meat products. You know, the little red guy with the pitchfork and the horns and the tail. And I think we do ourselves a great disservice because we tend to personify. That's not who the devil is. Uh, the word, there's two Greek words there, uh, diabolo. Does that sound familiar? Things like diabolical. Okay. Uh, literally, if you follow the, the etymology of the word, it literally means one who attacks, one who misleads. One who deceives, one who diverts, discredits, or slanders. Now think about that definition in terms of what Jesus experiences in the wilderness when he is tempted. One who misleads, deceives, diverts, discredits, or slanders. Who is it, by the way, who can deceive someone? Someone who's good-looking, and smooth, and slick. You're rarely deceived by someone who looks like a criminal, right? How does someone get close enough to a person to deceive them? Think used car salesman, right? We're not thinking about a guy who comes to Jesus with all fire in his eyes and red pitchfork. We're talking about someone who comes with a honey sweet voice and the smoothness of a salesman 
to say to Jesus, let's, let's talk, Jesus. Because you see, the devil is seeking to mislead Jesus about his identity in God, about the meaning of his sonship. The first temptation, and i got to tell you, if I'm fasting for 40 days, it could be problematic right off the top. I've done seven days, by the way. It's a challenge. Old Slick, we'll, we'll call him Slick, comes to Jesus and says, Wow, you must be hungry. And I can just picture Jesus looking at him and saying, Duh. I've been out here for 40 days. Of course I'm hungry. Slick says, hey, if, conditional preposition, if, if you're the Son of God, you have the power to take these stones. And by the way, when you're off by yourself for any concerted period of time, your eyes can play some really weird tricks on you really weird tricks. Ask anyone who's been by themselves in the woods, the forest, or the wilderness during the dark. Trust me, your eyes can play some serious tricks on you. He says, look at those stones. Don't they look like bread? If you are the Son of God, all you have to do is speak to those stones. You remember Moses speaking to a rock? Oh, he struck a rock when he was supposed to speak to it. He said, if you speak to those stones, they will be the freshest bread you can ever imagine. What would taste better after 40 days of fasting than a fresh baked keel of bread just loaded with butter? Maybe a little bit of honey from the, the nest nearby. If you are the Son of God, you can speak to those stones and they'll become bread. Slick, the devil, comes and says, If you're the Son of God, you can use your power to satisfy your earthly desire. You can trade the things of the spiritual world for the things of this earth, and your hunger will be satisfied. If you're the Son of God, that is. And I know a little something about human nature. I know a little something about human nature. When someone comes to us with those kind of statements, if you are who you say you are, we, what do you mean if? Of course I am. Watch what I can do. Right? Come on, let's be honest, right? Slick the devil comes and says, if you are the Son of God and you are hungry, you can speak and your hunger will be satisfied. When Jesus is physically at his weakest. Jesus responds with scripture and looks slick in the eye and said, There is so much more at stake here than bread, than hunger, and physical desire. There is dependence on God for the needs and necessities of life. Brothers and sisters, if I could help people in this culture today understand one lesson about life, it would be that one. There is more to life than simply the physical needs we have. But that's not the only temptation. The second temptation focuses on G Jesus' need for safety and security. Uh, look with me there. The devil, verse, chapter 4, verse 5, the devil took him to the holy city, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, if you're the son, if, there's that conditional preposition again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you on their hands, they'll bear you up, so you don't even smack your foot against a stone, or stub your toe. If you are the son of God, 
You have protection at your disposal. You have the legions of angels who will look out after you. They will take care of your physical needs. Do you think that was a powerful way to mislead someone who is bug-eaten, sun-burned, wind-burned, frozen, dehydrated, emaciated? All you have to do is jump. And God will take care of you. After all, Scripture says it. The temptation focuses on Jesus' need for safety and security. Basic human need, isn't it? Where are my educators in the room? Isn't there something along that line in Maslow's hierarchy of need? Right at the very bottom of the triangle? We have that need for safety and security. But Jesus quotes scripture back and says, no. There's more to life than simple worldly safety. There is a spiritual world out there picking up. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. God has a way of providing safety and security that mystify our human understanding. I was thinking about this passage this week. Uh, as I, and I was, you know, there's times when you come to Scripture and all of a sudden these themes, you become more aware of them. Does anybody have any idea how many commercials are on television right now concerning retirement, home security, um, two or three other themes like that? Oh yeah, insurance, funeral insurance, uh, reverse mortgages, all centering around this idea, you can be secure. All you need is a video doorbell. So you can be at the restaurant and see who's about to come in your house. All you need is a Comcast home security system. All you need is, I can't think of the name, I'll use my own, Fidelity Mutual Life so you can be secure in your own at old age. ADT, thank you, ADT. And all of a sudden, we're tempted to believe that our safety and our security lies here, now, in things that may never or will never last. The second temptation focuses on Jesus' need for safety and security. The third temptation seeks to mislead Jesus to use his power for prestige. Power and prestige. Can you imagine the spectacle it would create if Jesus on one of those high days climbed to the top of the temple and said, Hey, y'all! Jesus was from South Israel. Hey, y'all! I'm, I'm Jesus. I'm the Son of God. You all watch what I can do. And jumped off. Now we know what we would expect. I gotta tell you, I saw this thing on a video this week, this weird swing. I don't know how high up these people were, it seemed like miles. And the two of them were strapped into this bungee affair. It was like over a valley, hundreds and hundreds of feet. And, you know, they jumped. And forever, they fell and snapped that bungee and swung out over the side of the hill and come back. Why would you do that? Because of the spectacle of the thing. All I'm thinking is, there are people who are standing down below and watching and we're going to be covered in mess because I'm throwing up. We love a spectacle. We love to see people take their lives, and I think sometimes we like to see them fail more than we like to see them succeed. Can you imagine the following Jesus would have? 
Oh man, let me tell you, when I saw down at the temple today, this wild-haired guy from South Israel jumped off the temple. He's mad. He was fine. He says he's the son of God. We got to go see what that guy has to say. He'd become world famous like right now. Prestige. The spectacle. Can you imagine the buzz? You talk about viral. That would go viral. Signs and wonders. If you read another gospel this Lent season, the one of John, you find this theme occurring again and again about signs and wonders. And, and you know what happens with signs and wonders? They're never enough. Oh, Jesus, we saw you feed 5,000. Why don't you feed 10,000 now? We're hungry now. Why don't you do another one of those bread and loaves things? Or, Jesus, we, we caught your act out on the Sea of Galilee when you were walking across that. Man, you need to do that again. You need, can you surf the Jordan River without a board? It's always more. Prestige always needs more and more and more. Signs and wonders create the lowest level of faith. People always want to see the spectacular. It whets their appetite for more and more and more. Jesus responds with scripture reminding the tempter that you are to worship the Lord your God only in spirit and in truth. And he refuses to use his power to gain prestige and influence. I'm about to get really hard and sad. Jesus wasn't a savior of status and prestige. You see, each of these three temptations was a challenge to misinterpret who Jesus was, what his mission was, what God's purpose was, what it means to be a son of God. And in each of them, we find touchstones for our own life, our own walk, and our own discipleship. Satan never comes to us as that split-horned red guy with a pitchfork, you know, looking to burn our soul with his pitchfork. He always comes to us as slick, seeking to mislead us, seeking to twist God's word, seeking to get us, to encourage us, to embrace an identity other than God's own for us. To circumvent God's plan. Anyone ever read C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters? I cannot think of a more appropriate uh, attribution of Satan than Screwtape and Wormwood. You see, Screwtape is the senior demon, and his nephew, Young Wormwood, is designed to go out there, destined to go out and do some on the job training. He is destined to war against uh, the, the children of God. And his task is to go out and darken the heart of his patient. As you read through the, the rather lengthy book, he's trying to get his patient, the, the target of his temptations, to train him to love the things worldly and reject God. And, and in so doing, ultimately lead his patient to what we can only assume or imagine as hell. The young apprentice, Wormwood, is to keep his patient navel-gazing and being self-absorbed, clueless about who he is and what his real identity is, and thus trade the reality of God's plan for an alternative identity and falsehood. You see, screw tape and wormwood, they're not trying to infiltrate the church and create an army of serial killers. That's not how Satan works. That's not how Satan works. That's not how the devil works. What screw tape and wormwood are doing in the screw tape letters are trying to create a generation of people who were defined by selfishness, insincerity, 
pettiness and pride, fear, and the need to control the things of this world. I would submit to you, in allegorical form, Screwtape and Wormwood are trying to do the very same things in temptation that the devil pulled on Jesus Christ. I would submit to you this first Sunday morning in Lent that the devil is always trying to work in just such ways in our life to cause our focus to move from our fixed gaze on the cross and our life lived in Jesus Christ to the things of this world. To trade the importance of the eternal for that which is temporal and on its way out to fill us with pride. Look at who I am. Look at my influence. Look at where I'm going. Look what I've done. Rather to embrace the life of sacrifice and service and love. Look what I can control. Who? There's a big one. There's a big one. I am in control of my own life. And by the way, if you think I'm over mysticizing this, go back and read Genesis chapter 3. Because what we're describing is the devil's ammo in the lives of God's children. You remember what the devil said to Eve? Has God said? Has God said? Yeah. What God knows is you will surely become like God. He didn't say you'll become God. You'll become like God if you eat this fruit. Can I diagnose our society in one pregnant sentence? Our society is absolutely consumed with the idea that we can become like God. Oh, they wouldn't describe it that way. But that is certainly their drive. And if we're not careful, it's certainly our drive as well. Somewhere out there, the idea has arisen that temptation is bad. Temptation's not bad. Temptation's not bad. You should probably be concerned if you're not being tempted. You should probably be concerned if you're not being tempted. But what I would say to you is temptation is inevitable for God's children. Because what the devil wants is that which is God's. Temptation is inevitable. By the way, this isn't in my notes, it's a freebie. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness when he was the weakest. Could Jesus have sinned? Let me ask you a follow-up question. Was Jesus human? It's not much of a salvation if our Savior did not experience exactly what we did. Because in his victory over temptation, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have that same victory at our disposal. Temptation is inevitable for God's children. The temptations of materialism, oh, that hurts. The temptation of materialism, when babies have to wear the latest Nike shoes. The temptation of security, where your life is defined by the amount in your 401k, or the, the effectiveness of your security system where prestige and the, long, the longing to be someone is at our fingertips 
Those temptations are always there. But here is the good news of a Savior who was tempted in the wilderness. Whatever form temptation may take, it may be passed through by means of trust in God to provide what is needed. There's a word. There's a word. It's called... Are you ready? You might want to write this down. might not be a word that you recognize. There is a word. It is obedience. It is obedience. It is obedience in faith that God has already orchestrated the events of my life. And I can trust Him. A little while ago, I said the quickest way for me to walk you upside the head is to misuse God. Here's the second way, and maybe not quite as hard. Don't ever let me hear you say, the devil made me do it. Because you see, here's the spiritual reality. We serve a Savior who is victorious over Satan at every level. In the wilderness when he was hungry. The incarnate Savior in his power and might proved victorious over temptation. You see, the tester's power is real. But the tester's power is limited. The tester's power is limited. Only God is omnipotent. Like Jesus, Believers can trust in God and trust in God's saving power. Victory belongs to those who will follow Jesus through their temptation. So, we begin this 40-day journey of penitence. Our Lent journey reminds us that our faith forces us to engage the dark places in our life. We must go to those places where Slick whispers his honey smooth words in our ears. But you, you can do that. You can do that. However, Lent also reminds us that we do not fear temptation. We do not fear temptation. We do not fear temptation because we have a Savior who has been through them with us. So we come face to face with our temptations. We name them. We understand them. We understand what the evil one is trying to get us to train for our relationship with Jesus Christ. And in turn, we seek to live in the power of the grace of Jesus Christ giving attention daily to that voice in us. You see, Lent and penitence is not about guilt. It is not about guilt. If you are living a guilty Christian life, you're doing it. It's about freedom. Freedom from the things that this world would throw across our path. Freedom from the, path, the need to give in to temptation. Freedom from servitude to the world and to the world's agenda. And in its place, resurrecting and living the values of the kingdom of God. That's who we are. That's what we embrace. That is our life. We close this morning time of the word by coming to the table. Every Sunday morning during Lent, we will come to the table and receive the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. We are reminded that this is a powerful thing that we do. It's not magical. I, I don't say abracadabra, a lot of peanut butter sandwiches and poof. No, we come trusting 
that Jesus said to his disciples, do this often. We believe that we are at one table with our Lord. Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said these words, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This is my blood, which is shed for you. So we come to the table, this 2,000-year-old table, which Christians have been coming to in faith for 2,000 years. And the table to which they will come for 2,000 more, or until Jesus calls us home, believing we are receiving the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is is our life. Brothers and sisters, on this first Sunday morning in Lent, I invite you to come to the table to receive the life that comes in Jesus Christ, to receive that power, and today make this table a means of grace.